evening. Welcome to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, August the 15th. Uh, as uh, we are uh, having these services virtually, we will be singing some songs from Songs of Faith and Praise, Observing the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope that uh, you'll find interesting, enlightening, and uh, hopefully beneficial. So if you do have your song books and you'd like to sing along with us, uh, turn them to number 523. 523. <clears throat> I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. The Lord has said, go preach the word to all the world. The Lord has said, go preach the word to all the world. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done? Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done? If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done. Number 580. 580. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He heals the brokenhearted, and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted, and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted, and they cry no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. No more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 705. 705. We'll sing this song before the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> a common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow a common joy in the truth of God's Word. On the first day of the week, we are instructed to gather together uh, to break bread. Uh, we are 
uh, gathered together uh, to remember the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We find those words succinctly in Acts the 20th chapter and the 7th verse. Jesus uh, did that as he met with disciples at what we know as the Last Supper. And the Apostle Paul reiterated it in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, it's a very, very important time. It's a very important time to understand that this was God's plan from the beginning, that uh, we would always, we would in perpetuity remember that it was his plan to send Jesus here to earth to live among us, to be susceptible to all the temptations that humans are susceptible, yet to be our savior and our high priest and our redeemer. He did that by dying on the cross. He did that by uh, his body being broken and his blood being shed. And so as we look at those emblems that are before us, uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine, uh, they are memorials for us, memorials of how much God loves us and how much Jesus cared for us by going to the cross. Let's pray first for the bread. We're grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, you had this in your plan from the beginning, that Jesus came down from on high to live among men, and that knowingly he gave up his life that we might live, that his body was broken for us. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember that uh, his body was racked with pain, racked with pain for you and I. Uh, be with us and bless us as we partake. We pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. We think back to uh, the days when uh, the children of Israel were captive in Egypt and we know of the plagues that God sent down on them, the last of which was the death of the firstborn. We remember that the angel of death passed over the house, uh, the homes that uh, the blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the lampposts. That same blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled on our life through the blood that he shed for each one of us for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. We give thanks to your Heavenly Father for the uh, blessing of uh, your Son, uh, that he was willing to shed his innocent blood, and that blood is what washes away our sins. Bless us as we partake. Help us to hearken back to your plan. Help us to hearken back to what Jesus did for us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. My message this evening is uh, germane to uh, the giving portion of our service that we are told to lay by and store that which we have prospered. And so at this point in our service, uh, we will just take a small amount of time to give back to the Lord uh, what is His rightfully, what has always been His. Help us to give with an open heart, an open mind, and uh, knowing that uh, the Lord loves indeed a cheerful giver. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're just so grateful that uh, we have the ability to give on many levels. Uh, we know that uh, those uh, in the first century gave of themselves uh, along with giving of their means. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to open our hearts and uh, open our minds and open our, our, uh, our storehouse of treasure that we have give it back to the church so that the church can do your will here on earth to bring many more to you. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And our final song will be an old favorite, 595.
I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and his melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever wonderful song service. I hope that uh, all of us were enriched by it as we gave praise to our Lord. If you were there this morning, you uh, heard that the title of the lesson was, I hope, provocative. Uh, it's about the haves and the have-nots of the world. Interestingly enough, and if you research your Bibles, uh, Jesus talks more about money and wealth and riches than almost anything else that he talks about. The United States has become a country of the haves and the have-nots. The 15 richest politicians have a combined worth of $88.6 billion. American athletes are perhaps some of the wealthiest individuals on the planet. Michael Jordan is supposedly worth $2.2 billion. George Strait is worth $300 million and is the 21st richest singer in America. <laughs> Interesting. Interestingly, some of these sports figures and entertainers have fundraising events encouraging the average American to help the poor when they could do it themselves. Now, they can say that vicariously to us that they are doing that, but many of them spend more money on themselves than most people earn in a lifetime. We've seen this recently when uh, Jeff Bezos went uh, on a uh, trip into outer space. That trip cost $5.5 billion for a 10-minute space ride. Near it, Nearly all of the richest people in our country, I believe, are out of touch with a common man. I don't think they understand their situation, and I don't think they understand their struggle. In 2019, there were 10.5% of the people in America who live in or on the poverty level. For those of you who like uh, numbers, in 2021, the following statistics 
indicate that the poverty line for an individual or family, for an individual, the poverty line is $12,880 earned in a year. For a family of two, the poverty line is $17,420. And for a family of three, the poverty line is 21960 And if there are four people in the family, it is $26,500. These are figures for those who are working. These don't even take into account those who are homeless and the thousands of people who do not have jobs who might soon become homeless. With that in mind, and this is 2021, it's not surprising that when we go to our New Testaments that so much uh, interest is paid in wealth. You know, in the Old Testament, during biblical days, uh, uh, Job, at least in the very beginning, was very rich, and then in the end he was also. Solomon, David, Abraham were all very wealthy men. And so I do want to say this, and, and uh, I'm not jealous of those uh, wealthy people because I feel like that I'm wealthy on so many levels, as I'm sure that you do. God is, an, is not against people being wealthy, but I believe with all of my heart that God expects his people to use their wealth for the good of God's cause and, the bene and for the benefit of others who are not as fortunate. The Apostle Paul gave Timothy uh, some very, very important instructions about the wealthy. And this is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 through 19 and it reads instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on god who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy instruct them to be good uh, to do good to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Uh, God was saying uh, through the Apostle Paul that um, we need to look at what our true riches are. And remember, first, it's not wrong to be wealthy. Second, God expects wealthy people to help others. And third, as wealthy people help others, they are storing up spiritual wealth for their future. Now, what are you, uh, or, you know, where are you, and what does God expect of you? We're not Jeff Bezos. We're not Michael Jordan. We're not George Strait. We're not some of these very, very rich athletes. We're not some of these rich entertainers or rich entrepreneurs. What are we doing with our wealth? We don't compare to the elite wealthy of this country, but compared to many around the world, we're rich compared to many, many of the poor people in other continents around the world. So what does God to ex expect to the Christians in Ephesus, again from the pen of the inspired Apostle Paul? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, Paul wrote, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has needs. I think the New Testament tells us that we have the responsibility, a personal responsibility, to help others in need. There are countless stories and accounts in the New Testament about this. In Matthew 20, we have the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. When the 
the man came about early in the morning and he hired people and he hired people at various hours of the day promising them the same amount of money for their labor and he gave those who he hired late in the afternoon the same wage as he did to those who worked all morning and that there seemed to be a jealousy in that but the reality of it was it was up to the person who gave the wages to set the price and he did and so the people had to agree to that in Matthew chapter 6 and uh, I want to I want to turn to that real quickly in uh, Matthew chapter 6 from the Sermon on the Mount uh, uh, starting uh, with verse uh, 19 it says do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is there your heart will also be you see we have a much greater treasure in life than material wealth and these are the words of jesus he says where your treasure is that's where your heart will be and again he's not saying don't work for your money he's not saying don't support your family he's not saying don't send your kids to college he's not uh, he's not saying that you can't enjoy some of the pleasures of life he's saying make sure that you understand where your treasure lies we have the the uh, sorrowful story of Ananias and Sapphira in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts who sold money and laid it at the apostles feet uh, at the apostles feet but they lied about how much they actually made and how much they gave and we know what their fate was it was all about their hearts and where their treasure was and that treasure meant more to them than their integrity. And because of it, we know their fate. We have the story of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 to 31, who came to Jesus asking Jesus, you know, what he had to do to become part of the Lord's kingdom what he had to do to gain entrance into the kingdom after this kingdom on earth. And Jesus understood, and he knew that the rich young ruler was rich. And he knew that the rich young ruler's heart lied not in the real treasure in life, but it lied in those riches that he had. And it doesn't tell us uh, how he got those riches and so when Jesus said to him if you want to truly enter the kingdom of God you have to give up all those riches to feed the poor and then you can enter the kingdom and isn't it a, a sad story that the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because his treasure his monetary treasure was worth more to him he was a have he was not a have not and he wasn't willing to give up his his place in the world as a have to give what he had to the have nots and it says that he went away sorrowfully and then in Luke the 12th chapter and the 18th verse we had uh, the story of the farmer who one year had a, a fantastic crop and uh, he stored up this crop and he had riches and and he thought about you know uh, eating and eating and drinking and being merry and then he even said you know what this is so good that i'm going to tear down my barns i'm going to build bigger barns and the lord came to him in the night and he said your life is required of you tonight what have you done tonight the man's focus was not on the kingdom. The man's focus was on his riches 
and his soul was required of him that night. God also expects Christians to give to the church. Just a few moments ago after the Lord's Supper, we had the, um, the giving part of our service. We're, we're supposed to give what we have laid by in store. And so we have the example in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. Uh, he said, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you should put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. God expected then, and I believe he expects now, each Christian that has prospered to give into the church's treasury, treasury each Lord's Day, because the church is God's kingdom here on earth. And how we treasure the church is how we treasure our own hearts. God expects that person to put their treasure into the church's treasury. You know, uh, I've come to learn a long, long time ago that uh, this world is made up of givers and takers. God expects Christians to be givers. Now, are there times when we can be takers and still be part of the kingdom? Of course. But he expects us to be givers. What do you and I do as individuals to help other individuals? In Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 24, it says, let's look at how to, to encourage one another through love and good deeds. This is part of uh, what we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to care for our own. No one in the church family should go hungry. No one in the church family should be in such a dastardly plight that they, they might lose their home or they might lose their car or they, you know, uh, we are to take care of those within the kingdom here on earth. What do we do to help the church to have the funds that are necessary to be able to do that? You know, in most cases within the church, most of us fall into the category of the haves, not the have-nots. And so when we look at this, we look at it through the lens of the Lord's Word, understanding that so much is written about how we handle uh, the gifts that uh, have been bestowed upon us and how, uh, how much these gifts that you have blessed us with uh, mean to us. And we have to make sure that the monetary part of our life doesn't overshadow the spiritual part of our life. That we are so concerned about the next dollar, the next hundred dollars or whatever, that we forget about our souls. You know, we're told, what will a man give in exchange for his soul. There's no amount of money. Remember the rich man who was going to tear down his barns. His soul was required of him that very night. And we don't know when our soul will be required of us. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be years down the line. But God expects us to be just stewards in his kingdom, we're supposed to do with the Lord's uh, gifts to us uh, good things, like the parable of the talents. We're not to bury our talent. We're, we're to make more of it so that we can do more good things. Remember James talking about 
faith without works being dead. Our faith can be strong, but if we don't display our faith through the deeds that we do, then we're not only shortchanging ourselves as far as our spirituality is concerned, but we're shortchanging the kingdom of God here on this earth. Uh, what are you and what does God expect of you? Well, I think we can view ourselves as the haves of this world. And I think that we can always remember that there are folks out there that are in need. We understand we can't feed every hungry, hungry person on the, faith, on the face of this earth. But we are to make our little corner of this earth a better place to live. And part of that is by being willing to share, not like Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira and holding back, not about the rich young ruler who was afraid to uh, give up his wealth because it meant so much to him, not of the laborers in the vineyard or the, the, those that were given certain talents, uh, not of the man who had the great crop. We need to remember that our, our thought for tonight is all about the haves and the have-nots. Let's all look at ourselves as the haves of this world. Let's make sure that we support the Lord's kingdom here on the earth, both monetarily with what we have been prospered, but also with the, the gift of, of our time, the gift of our effort to go out of our way to visit the sick, uh, to help the poor. I believe it's such an important aspect of what we uh, are all about. I think it's so important for us to realize that uh, uh, being a Christian uh, comes with a greater responsibility. You know, uh, I think part of what makes Christianity is so great that in many respects it's hard. It's what makes it great. The hard makes it great. It makes it great because we know that we can do greater things than we even think that we can do. Let's just remember how, how we have been blessed and remember how important the spiritual part of our lives are. Let's, uh, let's just uh, remember to, uh, as Paul admonished Timothy, that the rich of the world are to give uh, to the treasury, that uh, uh, we must labor with our hands so that we'll have something to share with the one who is in need. May God bless us as being haves you know, I can't help but thinking of that widow putting those two small, seemingly insignificant coins into the treasury, knowing that she literally gave all that she had. And so many of the parables, the parable, the pearl of great price, the parable, the field where the treasure was hidden, all have to do with riches and how people handle that and how important it is for them, uh, how important it is for us to understand the needs of those around us and share with those that we can share with. I hope that we've all been blessed by this uh, message this evening and that uh, we can uh, take this to heart. I pray that you have begun your Christian walk so that you can see how important it is to, to encourage one another in love and good deeds. And if you haven't started your Christian walk, you haven't confessed Jesus as the Son of God and repented of your former life and be, been baptized for the remission of your sins, we open that invitation to you this evening. If you need to come to the Lord, get in touch with one of us by phone, by email, anyway, and we will be there helping you to start your walk. Uh, I pray that God will continue to bless us richly. 
Let's close in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for the wonderful blessings of life. We are indeed so grateful for the spiritual blessings of life that even though some of us may not have the, the riches of the world, that we may be spiritually rich and that we may be spiritually rich to the point that we know that one day we will live with you, which is our goal. In order to do that, we must behave here in the kingdom on earth the way you have instructed us to behave. We pray that we would be the godly people that you'd want us to be, that we would reflect the values that are reflected in our New Testaments about uh, what true wealth is and where the treasure in our heart resides. Continue to bless us through the evening. Help us to uh, put our heads on the pillow and, and think of how important that you, our God, are to us and how important that Jesus is to us. Bless us and be with us. Forgive us of our sins. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. May God bless you all. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the soul.